Ben Huang, uh, head of Profusa. This is a great call. Ben's a very gracious guy, very nice, very humble. Um, their technology is pretty amazing because it's a, it's a, essentially it's like a hydrogel that gets placed in your body or, you know, perhaps injected, but placed in there. Um, and the sensor can last for months or even years and your body doesn't seem to attack it and uh, try to get rid of it or form scar tissue around it. And they can track things beyond just, let's say, blood glucose. They can track oxygen saturation of the tissues and, he said, lactate and a bunch of other things. Um, so that's amazing for many, many reasons. One is that, again, you can get continuous monitoring of these parameters. So I've, I've worn personally a continuous glucose monitor. And I can tell you, you see a very different story if you wear that and look continuously versus, you know, prick your finger once every few hours or once a day. You're missing out on tons of stuff going on. So this will be a super useful thing for people to have. Uh, we spoke about how the oxygen saturation portion that could be used to help people monitor if they have sleep apnea or snoring or poor sleeping on an ongoing basis. There's so many things involved with this technology, like I'm excited for him, but boy, does he have a lot of work ahead of him. Uh, there's also maybe privacy concerns that I didn't bring up. Uh, you know, this, this data will be reported where, and can that be accessed by hackers and things like that? So we get into a bunch of these issues, but fascinating technology. Great guy. You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech and Finding Genius podcast. I have Ben Huang, a CEO of Profusa, P-R-O-F-U-S-A. Um, did I, I'm not sure if I pronounced it right, but uh, Ben, is that right? Profusa, the best way to pronounce the company? You did. That was, that was oh. perfect. It's almost as, as if I've coached you on it. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> yeah, well, sometimes I've been having uh, issues pronouncing things properly and my, my kids make fun of me, so. So I'm glad I made <laughs> No worries. You did my Excellent. name great and you did a company name great. Perfect. Well, good. Well, tell me about Profusa. What's the uh, premise of the company? Now, Rich, first of all, thanks a million for having me on this podcast. Uh, I'm a fan and I appreciate the work that you do. Uh, Profusa, Thank what you. we do, what we, yeah, we, uh, we here at Profusa have worked really hard in creating a platform technology that really enables an individual to be able to understand their key personal biochemistry in real time uh, in a form factor and use case that's very amenable to uh, just happening in the background for an individual where you don't have to intervene on the technology. It's almost like wearing a Band-Aid or wearing a watch and forget it. And uh, do so at a, at a cost where the economic burden would never uh, be a barrier for you to adopt this technology. So what it does is it enables an individual to understand um, their biochemistry in an accuracy and um, in a way that a physician could actually make a therapeutic choice. But getting that data instead of drawing blood and getting it to a lab, you get the data in real time uh, as easily as wearing a, a watch or wearing a Band-Aid. Yeah, that's tremendous. I, I get um, probably 100 blood markers tested every six months, and I, I put them in Excel, and I track them if they go up or down, and supplements keep them in range. And sadly, that's magic, you know, to, uh, to a doctor I go to. I thought that's, you know, an obvious, simple thing. But um, when you say biochemistry, uh, what, what are you focusing on? Like, is it looking at a person's, you know, set of biomarkers, whatever that may be? Or when you say biochemistry, what does that mean? What is the device measuring? Yeah, so, so um, what we do, uh, what we measure actually are things that a physician would care about. So, for example, uh, every time you go to a doctor, and I'm glad to hear, Rich, that you uh, take the care and, and are interested enough in your health to actually 
uh, put it on their Excel spreadsheet and keep track of it. Unfortunately, most people don't do that. And what ends up happening is um, you go see a doctor maybe once a year uh, if you're compliant and if you're actually a really good patient. And you see a doctor once a year, and during that hospital visit or during that doctor visit, the doctor might order a blood test. And they will look at panels. They will look at your uh, glucose level, sodium level, calcium level, potassium level. Those kind of uh, markers and uh, in that blood test, you get that information once a year. And what we do here at Profusa is we measure uh, biochemistries um, like those biochemistries, these off tissue oxygen, glucose, lactate, uh, potentially sodium, potassium, things that physicians actually will look at today and order a test for. But instead of looking at it once a year, we actually have a way to get that out of your body in real time throughout the entire uh, intervening period between those doctor's visits. So in real time, as you're living your life, you now have the ability to look at how your behavior and how your activity and your choices, based on what you eat, how active you are, actually changing the way those um, numbers go up or go down or go outside of the healthy range or go or stay within the healthy range. And we believe it's that real-time connection of what the, the, the wealth of clinical data, for example, that allows a doctor to say, hey, you know, your blood sugar should be at 110 milligrams per deciliter. And if it goes up to above 140 milligrams per deciliter, that's actually bad for you. Um, instead of just having that dialogue, you now in real time have the ability to track and say, gosh, uh, just because I ate that donut, I ate that bowl of rice, or if I don't uh, go out and ride my bike or go don't, don't, don't go out and walk the way I normally would do, my blood sugar is behaving in this way that's anomalous to my health, you could do something about it. And I think that's really the magic and the key differentiator for what we do in terms of individual's health. You don't have to rely on a once a year dialogue. You could actually have real time information that allows you to, to, to uh, change your behavior and change your activity in a positive way. Well, I've worn a CGM. You know, I've worn like the Dexcom G6 for a number of months, but what, again, what specific biomarkers can you, can a doctor tune it and say, I want these four instead of these seven? Or, you know, how many different biomarkers does uh, your device track? Yeah, so our device is not tunable by the doctor. Our device is when we, when we develop a sensor and get it approved and get it on the market, that sensor measures uh, a particular set of analytes or a particular set of biomarkers that we uh, tune it to. So right now our, uh, we have a product that's actually approved. Uh, patients and physicians are benefiting from this data today. Uh, that sensor measures dissolved tissue oxygen. Uh, we have a the next product, which is uh, measuring glucose, that's going to be uh, that's in human studies today, and we expect that to be on the market uh, within the next year or two. We have a lactate program uh, in house that that's uh, developing a sensor for to measure lactate, and we demonstrated the ability for our sensors to measure sodium, potassium, ethanol, calcium, urea, and CO2, and um, we just develop more and more of these sensors and getting into funnel and, and launch the product at these sensors as these sensors. Well, how do you have a, a device with a form factor that doesn't stick you with a hundred needles? I mean, can you get all this through one like hair, hair width needle that yeah. goes into the skin or like, what can you say about how the device works? Yeah, no, I, I'm happy to share uh, exactly how the device works, Rich. That's actually the, the, the big technical innovation for us. You know, for the last 50 years or so, this idea of being able to measure um, your biochemistry very accurately and continuously is an idea that's been around and people have tried uh, to solve. The issue has always been that your body is absolutely and exquisitely good at determining what belongs inside the body versus what doesn't belong inside the body. So um, anybody who's ever gotten a splinter will understand what I'm talking about. You get a splinter in your, in your uh, body and no matter how, it doesn't matter how small that splinter is, uh, it gets infected, it starts getting a little painful. And if your body doesn't eject that sense, that um, splinter from your body, your body starts wrapped, wrapping collagen and scar tissue around that little piece of splinter. It, it's basically saying, hey, if I can't get rid of you, I'm going to wall you off so you cannot hurt me as a foreign body. And listen, as a human species, we celebrate that. We celebrate our ability, our body's ability to determine what belongs inside versus what doesn't belong inside. Uh, otherwise, we wouldn't be here talking on this podcast. On the other hand, though, if, you, if your goal is to introduce a foreign element in the body so that you can measure with high degree of precision uh, biochemistry that we're actually describing, that actually is a big problem. That, that, that what's called a foreign body response that all of us have, it's actually a big problem. So current sensors that are available out in the market today, the reason they don't work for a very long period of time, the reason they only work for weeks 
uh, days and weeks is not because the sensors stop functioning, the actual device. It is that the body starts encapsulating that micro needle that's through your skin and trying to wall it off so that the needle is no longer sensing the body, it's actually sensing the scar tissue. And there's a big misalignment of that value then to what's happening inside your body. And that's a big, big problem for the sensing uh, uh, world. And it's actually a problem that people have been trying to solve for a long time and haven't been. Our technology has overcome that foreign body reason. We put inside, under the skin, a very, very small sliver of hydrogel. And that hydrogel is basically the same material that your, um, your so uh, soft contact lenses are made from. It's soft, it's pliable, it's very tissue-like. And the silver of hydrogel that we, we, we inject under the skin is so small that it fits inside the interior diameter of a typical hypodermic needle. So the placement of the sensor is no more invasive than getting a vaccine or no more invasive than getting a vial of blood drawn. But once that little sliver of hydrogel is uh, injected under your skin, it now is uh, your body, instead of rejecting it, your body actually welcomes it. It's uh, constructed in a way where your body integrates healthy tissue throughout the interior of that sliver of hydrogel, holds it in place, and there's no foreign body response against it. What that means is now the hydrogel could work for months and years. And for you to get data out of that hydrogel, you just have to have a reader on the surface of your skin that takes a signal uh, from the hydrogel and gives you an accurate number. And that difference of the body's um, uh, embracing of that little sliver of hydrogel, for example, changes the entire uh, sensing world. Because now, instead of having to change your sensors every two to, to three weeks or so, uh, one little injection makes your sensor uh, work in your body now for months. And more importantly, when you every time you throw away a conventional sensor that's on the market to pull it out of your body and you throw it away, you're throwing away $35, $40. With our little sliver of hydrogel, because it functions for so long, the, and anybody who's actually ever worn soft contact lenses and know how inexpensive soft, soft contact lenses could be, um, the cost of our uh, device is, uh, could be incredible. It means that the accessibility for an individual for this technology is not going to be determined by your ability to pay. It means that to embrace the technology like ours, to be able to measure real-time biochemistry for you, is done in a way where adoption is going to be quite high because you don't have to mess with it. You don't have to change it. You don't have to deal with it. You see the doctor once, and you just kind of go and live your life. And because we have a sliver of hydrogel okay. that's actually under the skin and we measure the chemistry directly, the accuracy of what we measure is what doctors care about. I think the changes so you're making a microenvironment that houses the needle that <clears throat> prevents the body from rejecting it or walling it off and allows it to continue sensing for a very long period of time. Right? Yeah, so actually it's not even a microenvironment for the needle. What we put under the skin, the, inject, the hydrogel that's injected under the skin, in it itself, that, sensor, that piece of hydrogel itself, that sensor itself, um, does not elicit this major foreign body response. And there's no, there are no electronics embedded. There's no battery inside the little sliver of hydrogel. It literally is just that hydrogel with some sensing chemistry that's fluorescence-based. And what the reader does on the surface of your skin, there's no needle that's coming through the skin. Once you inject that sensor that's inside your body, under the, and if you, every time you want to interrogate and, and know, hey, what's that glucose value right now, that reader shines a light through the skin. And that light through optical means is what interrogates that that hydrogel. And because it's done by light, you could actually do it quite frequently. And so you could take a, a data point uh, every second, every five seconds, and give you a continuous trend as you, uh, throughout your day. Yeah, that's amazing. Huh. So the sensor can last for months, theoretically, maybe even a year? Yeah. So we've, uh, in our uh, uh, studies, we've had sensors that lasted for as long as four years. Um, we can we routinely have sensors for more than a year right around this. so the functionality is listen ultimately we understand that there are a couple of barriers that we really need to overcome from a technology uh, perspective if if we want our technology to actually have a major impact in in, in healthcare one is you have to measure what doctors care about uh, we listen we we feel very fortunate to actually build a technology and build a company where we gain a lot of learnings from other people and, and the efforts that they brought to bear before we were even around. And I think one of the things that we actually learn is proxying, you know, whether it's proxying steps, proxying uh, your skin galvanic response, these things that physicians don't think about today, it's very hard for you to make inroads in healthcare when you provide data that has not been tried and true in a clinical environment because doctors won't 
it, uh, just won't accept and use that data for anything that's meaningful in terms of therapeutic choices or how they manage their patients. So we, we know that whatever we measure has to be something that physicians actually care about. But um, the learnings that we have from the CGM environment is, but in order for you to get vast adoption, the way you measure it needs to be done in a way where it doesn't add a huge amount of burden onto the user or onto the person who's actually using uh, Otherwise, people uh, just won't adopt the technology if you want them to um, mess around with the sensor much. And so for us, it was really important not only to measure, but we have to measure it in a way, to your point, Rich, that the sensor will last for months and for years so that when you visit the doctor and doctors put the sensor inside you, after that, you just go home and live your life. It's as if that sensor is really not in, and the data actually only comes out passively. Um, if you get those two things right and then get the cost component right so that uh, anybody could actually have access to the technology without worrying about do I have to you know, go take out a loan or whether reimbursement will pay for it. If you get those three things right, then I think the whole vision that folks have around digital health, telemedicine, personalized medicine can become a reality. How do you get the, uh, <laughs> the hydrogel out when it's time? You don't need to. Um, if you really, really have to take it out, um, there's a way to take it out just kind of like a tissue biopsy. But our, uh, the, the longevity of the sensor and the regulatory approval process uh, obviously looks at how safe the sensor is inside the body and can that be a, a permanent indwelling uh, material inside the body. And uh, from all of our studies and all the tests, um, the sensor is as safe as could be. Um, when you think about it, right, we constantly, for a variety of reasons, whether it's um, medical need, uh, whether it's cosmetic, we put wrinkle fillers inside our body, we have implants, uh, pacemakers, knee, knee, knee joints, um, uh, heart valves, um, meshes inside the body that actually stay in the body for a very long time, if not forever. Um, our device is actually kind of in that category. There's no need to actually take it out. And by the way, the sensor material is so small what we put inside the body is actually so small that it, that you can't feel it. There's just no impact on the safety perspective as well as just a, a kind of living with the sensor of the body. Yeah, so I don't know. I, I'm not saying cover the person in sensors, but would it make sense to have, uh, let's say, two sensors placed into someone at different parts of their body uh, so that you could do a comparative ongoing analysis? Because maybe there's a local change in the concentration of one of the variables that's not reflected elsewhere in the body, and this could capture it. Yeah, that's actually a really smart question. So that's right. The sensors measures the local environment. And so the physiology, right, your anatomy and your physiology is going to drive uh, sensor differences or signal differences depending on which part of the anatomy you actually put it on. So what you're saying is absolutely true. And so for certain applications, um, we've been talking about glucose for a while, so let's talk about glucose some more. For certain applications, such as trying to manage an individual's glucose level, the, it's just a, it, it, the way, the, the, the time frame or time horizon in which a glucose molecule actually diffuses throughout the blood vessel and into the body is at a scale where it doesn't matter where you measure, where, where to measure your uh, interstitial fluid uh, glucose level, it's going to equilibrate out. Uh, over the period of time, so you could, you know, measure it on the arm, measure it in the in the abdomen, measure it um, uh, in uh, on on your upper thigh. The values are going to be the same. It's going to be reflective of what's happening throughout the body. There are certain applications, however, as you're alluding to, where local dynamics and local differences actually matter and are meaningful. Our first oxygen product, for example, on the market in Europe measures the amount of oxygen within a tissue. And there are many uh, conditions and diseases in which the lack of oxygen delivery to that tissue bed causes wounds to not heal. So major flap reconstruction, there are surgical reconstructions. In our case, um, it's um, in diabetic foot ulcerations, in critical limb ischemia, for example, where the local tissue where that wound is happening, where the wound has occurred and the wound is not healing, that local tissue's oxygen will be very different than if you take that same measurement on your arm or in your chest. And that actually is what you want to do in those applications. You want to be able to measure what is it about the local area and what therapeutic choices as you apply them to that patient can restore that tissue oxygen in that local. And it's not a systemic issue, right? There's nothing wrong with that patient's lungs to be able to take in oxygen and deliver oxygen throughout the body. It is just that at that foot, that tissue is not seeing oxygen. And our sensor's ability to be able to measure local, very localized data um, in those applications becomes incredibly important. Um, how deep inside the body can a sensor be placed 
where the hydrogen will be placed and still be able to read it. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a trade-off between signal strength, the light path that comes back, uh, and the depth. And so it, the, the, our current product configuration, that little sliver of hydrogel that we inject via hyperdynamic needle, uh, the target depth be- below the skin is anywhere from two to six millimeters. It's actually got a pretty wide tolerance. Um, if you get it a little deeper, it just means that your signal is a little weaker, but it still works. If uh, uh, For certain applications under development and with some of our collaboration partners, um, we, we the, some of the application where you want to go even deeper than that, um, but then you want to p- put a p- bigger piece of hydrogel um, in your target tissue because you want more signal to be able to come out of this. But for uh, for the current uh, use case, it's about two to six millimeters under. The- Would there ever be a way a to? Uh, could you ever fuse this to the wall of a uh, of a vein, and then once it's fused, open it up to the uh, to the vein to the interior so that you could monitor the blood continuously like this? Yeah, I think there are a variety of applications in in your podcast is future tech. So let's talk about how this technology can uh, be developed further. Absolutely. I think um, the this this uh, the concept of a hydrogel where the bot it where the body is friendly to this material inside enables you to think through a variety of applications that's really neat, right? So you can monitor what's intravascularly, uh, continuously. Uh, um, we, we've done some early stage research and work to think about how this hydrogel could actually potentially be inserted into the, into the brain to, uh, to um, manage stroke victims um, or people actually suffering the effects of stroke. Um, there are uh, hypoxic applications, a pilot, for example, before they pass out, their uh, oxygen, their ability for oxygen to be delivered to the is compromised, and then they pass out, obviously that's a problem for that pilot, uh, pilot safety. This sensor actually has the ability to be able to detect those types of events before uh, they actually occur. So a variety of applications, you know, the, the bottom line, Rich, is this. If you have a way to be able to look at in real time, important biomarkers as they're occurring and changing inside the body. There's a way of actually doing at a low cost. I think the world becomes very, very different, the way doctors think about clinical practice. Um, Because now you could actually catch things um, that are bad before they actually happen, and you could actually start intervening before these major symptoms actually occur. Um, And that's really the future. Well, there would be a tremendous amount of learning just by the continuous nature of the readings. Like when I had a CGM, I would notice, okay, during the night while I slept, my glucose would change. And I asked around why, and very few people knew. You know, I noticed yeah. circadian effects. Um, you know, I noticed, uh, for instance, with meals, like, you know, my wife had one too. So she would eat a meal, for instance, that had, you know, sugar, a lot of carbs in it. And we would see her sugar would spike and then dramatically fall. And if you just tested it with a finger stick instead, you'd miss all of that. So as soon as you're able to continuously monitor anything, you'll get a completely different picture than we're getting right now with the occasional uh, yeah, reading Rich, of it, which is really cool. So I'm sure there'll be tremendous learning ab- there. Yeah, absolutely, Rich. No, sorry to interrupt. I, I completely agree. You know, we, we actually uh, have already gotten that insight in a very practical and tangible way where it's helping us think about what this data means, but also directly helping patients. So... Uh, you know, what it, it turns out that what makes you and I different for a variety of, you know, there are a lot of things that are different about us, but one of the things that make that that's different about you and me is, is the definition of health and also how our body can process either foods or process things that are in our body that change the bio, biochemistry marker. Um, uh, it's not just about where your what your number or what the value is at a given time. It's about how that value changes, the slope in which it rises and the slope in which it declines. How quickly does it change uh, relative to the food you eat or the, the exercise or whatever activity you might have. So the shape of the curve, if you will, is just as important than the actual value. And as a matter of fact, there are certain applications where the shape of the curve is everything. And just the value itself doesn't actually give you that information. And so you're absolutely right that um, uh, be able to monitor something continuous, not only does it create real-time um, 
a, a, a real-time correlation between activity and the outcome. But just the fact that you actually are now drawing a, a shape of a curve as opposed to creating data in dots with a lot of information missing in between those uh, data points, I think man uh, will contribute a lot to clinical science and help people think about what the what the uh, disease state uh, of a certain chronic disease would be. We're finding out from the data that we're gathering today that that's absolutely true, and we expect that to be true for many, many uh, other conditions. Yeah, and also you could see if you look at various biomarkers, and some may move in tune with one another, some may move in opposition, some may be leading or lagging indicators. So, I mean, even outside of just looking at one curve for one marker, there would be a tremendous amount of learning there as well. Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, we in, in uh, as we think about how this technology really can move science forward, one of the analogies we draw is, you know, how the ability to get DNA sequence information inexpensive, how that actually has changed medical science just over the last 20 years. Um, when you have data that you could act on, when you have information that is critical for a certain set of analysis, and you make that information, that data available in a way that matters, I think it changes the world. Uh, DNA sequencing data, not only did it uh, you know, create a, uh, all of this knowledge around the basic science and the fundamental science of DNA and genomics, but the impact that it has on treatment, on proteome, uh, has just been incredibly profound, right? The, the, the huge areas of research now on therapeutics um, are driven off of the knowledge and foundation of knowledge that have been gained off of the ability to sequence DNA in And we think that the next step for science is this, that if you could think, if you could look at the way in which biomarkers change on an individualized basis, and you're able to get that information, that data, in a robust, um, trustworthy way over a larger population. Um, I, you know, as smart as we like to think we are within the walls of Profusa, my guess is we haven't even scratched the surface on the type of knowledge in the scientific advancement uh, that could be had off of this data, just like all of the fields that have been opened up with the availability of DNA data. We think that there'll be a next wave of that coming um, based on what we could provide to the scientific. Well, it's just like, uh, you know, uh, an insulin pump is not hooked up to, unbelievably, uh, a CGM yet. Um, once your device is in place, it can interface, let's say, with a pacemaker. You know, let's say uh, a nutrient level corresponds with the uh, the pacemaker needs to be changed somehow, The you know, the algorithm of the, the pacing. Or, again, a CGM, depending on, uh, <clears throat> you know, your levels, the insulin pump may need to produce less or more. I mean, so your readings can interact with any other device that would be, let's say, inside or adjacent to the body or if someone's taking medication you know, to supplement something and they get the reading that they have enough at that particular moment, don't take that medication when you otherwise may take it or that supplement when you otherwise may take it. I mean, this would be, you know, you'd be able to tune again medications, when to take and how much. Uh, you'd be able to interact with other, other devices and on and on. There's a lot. Absolutely. And I think part of, and part of what gets us really excited about it is all of those applications that you actually described, not only are they within reality, within the grasp of reality, but if you could actually, you could actually accelerate those use cases becoming reality um, from a timing perspective. You could actually accelerate that from, to, to, to becoming reality by uh, having more data available for you to analyze, right? So, um, right now, continuous glucose monitors are being adopted by probably half a million, uh, uh, 500,000 to probably seven, 800,000 people. Right? It's a, it's a number of, the number of users are, are you, you could talk about it in hundreds of thousands. In population health, while that is a significant number, it's actually um, not large enough for you to be able to do a lot of the things that we're actually talking about here. So if you actually could get continuous glucose data, for example, in on millions of people, and those millions of people are not just type 1 diabetic, uh, diabetes patients, but they're type 1 insulin dependent, type 2 insulin dependent, type 2 insulin non-dependent, and then everybody else, pre-diabetes patients, you have a large population in which you have this data to come from. The ability for you to to create the algorithm and the data science to drive those decisions that you're describing, personalized decisions, would be much more effective, much faster, and also be able to benefit a much broader set of patients or individuals with very different backgrounds and very different contexts. And you know, I don't want to I don't want to underserve this whole notion that 
not only is it the right data, but it's the right data that's accessible for many, many people because either of cost or usability. I think those three things really combine to tell a potentially powerful and bring the reality uh, of personalized health and personalized medicine, uh, personalized dosing on, medi uh, on medicine, medical adherence, and all the other things that we haven't thought about. Bring that into reality much sooner than later. Yeah, no, that's great. I mean, with the um, the oxygen saturation of the tissue, I could see that would be, uh, you know, the, the latest uh, or the greatest way to do a sleep study. It's ongoing. And for people that have, let's say, apnea or snoring, you'd be continuously monitoring whether the tissue saturation goes below a critical threshold. So there's so many applications. Like, exactly I don't know right. how yeah, you guys are going to have to, like, license the heck out of this thing because there's no way that you can do everything, even though it's, you'd want to. Yeah, no, that, that's absolutely right. There's no way we could do everything. And quite frankly, like I said earlier, you know, as, as clever as we like to think we are, we're not smart enough to actually be the expert on everything. And so we are very active in terms of looking at partnership opportunities where other organizations could bring to bear their expertise and be able to take our platform um, to accomplish the goals, uh, the noble goals that they actually have. And I think that's, that's absolutely right. The, the path to how this could change the world really needs to go through entire uh, broader industry and broader group of dedicated scientists who want to solve um, a variety of health problems and not just, uh, not just us. And we're uh, constantly having those conversations and being very open. So you're through clinical trials for at least some of the applications and it's, is it actually in use or when will it be, when can I go to my doctor and say, hey, I want to profuse a device. And yeah, so we're approved in Europe. Uh, so if you're actually in Europe and you go see a doctor, we, we are approved uh, in Europe. We're still a small company and we're in the very early stages of our journey here. So we're very thoughtful about how to roll this product out um, uh, carefully. We roll it out in a scientifically responsible way. We work with physicians that actually give us a ton of advice on, on as they apply it to their patient uh, practice and how we can actually. Um, so our first product is available in Europe. It is approved all over Europe, but we are uh, um, uh, on a pretty smaller scale. There are seven hospitals in, uh, in the European Union that are actually in today. We continue to add on to that footprint. Um, we are in the process, actually, of uh, getting the FDA approval for this product in the U.S., so unfortunately it's not available here, but hopefully soon. And like I said, the other um, uh, analytes that we're measuring, those products are in the pipeline and we'll continue to roll it out as they're ready. We have one program in clinical stu in human studies right now, that's a glucose program, and others are in the pipeline. So it, we're in the early stages, Rich, but if you're if you're in Europe, let me know. Um, happy to uh, take you over to a physician that are using it and let you let you see how it works. Yeah, where in the body do you put it? Like in the stomach area, or you know, like on the leg, or where, where does it tend to go? Yeah, so it depends. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the use case. So in Europe right now, the app major application is for critical uh, critical limb ischemia patients. So these are folks with wounds that will not heal on their foot because of all, uh, because of uh, lesions uh, in the arteries that supply blood supply to the extremity. And so in those patient populations, the sensors actually go into the foot or around the wound that will not heal. In certain applications, other clinical studies that we have going on for uh, sleep apnea, like you said, uh, and others, uh, it really depends. It's either in the belly, it's in the upper uh, upper arm. Um, we've had uh, for certain exercise facility putting in large muscles, like in the thigh area. Um, it just really depends on what the application. Okay, right. well, very good. Well, how can people find out more info about Profusa and keep tabs on it? You know, put our own little sensor so that we know when you come here to the U.S. and Know, it can get at it. Yeah, so our website is a great uh, place for uh, information. We're constantly updating it and upgrading that. That's uh, www.profusa.com. Um, you know, and follow us on, on LinkedIn, uh, Twitter. Uh, we're pretty active there uh, as well. So, you know, we 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 love what we do. Uh, we have a passionate group of people that love doing it. Uh, I love talking about it. And so, for folks who are actually interested, please keep tabs on us. Um, we look forward to actually to serve humanity in a much more meaningful way. That's great. Well, I appreciate you coming on the podcast. Thank you. Thanks, Rich, for the invitation and for your interest. It was a lot of fun talking to you. You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now. 
and the companies that are using these technologies for the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you. Thank you.